Welcome everybody. We have our grand rounds today. And our speaker is Ellen McGough. PT, PhD. It's not on. Uh, she's an assistant professor in the Department of Rehabilitation Medicine. Her research focuses on functional markers of disability and the effects of the exercise interventions on motor and non-motor functions of older adults. Should try this again? Uh, that on? There we go. Okay, maybe stand a little closer. Yeah. Um, let's see. Her research focuses on functional markers of disability and the effects of exercise interventions on motor and non-motor function in older adults with neurodegenerative disease. Of particular interest are early markers that are responsive to exercise interventions in older adults with Alzheimer's and Parkinson's disease. She is using laboratory-based and portable motion analysis technology and performance-based testing to examine walking and mobility in older adults with varying levels of cognitive and physical impairment. She is also using magnetic resonance imaging to study brain correlates of function in older adults with mild cognitive impairment and early Alzheimer's disease. The overarching goals of her research program are to identify early indicators of functional decline and to develop exercise interventions that help adults with neurodegenerative disease maintain relative independence. Okay. Thank you. All right, thank you. <coughs> okay. Can you hear me? Is this I'm quite well. Can this be turned up? <coughs> That's still not. Is that better? Okay. So I have to stand pretty close to this. All right. How's that? Okay. All right. Okay. First of all, I'd like to uh, thank uh, thank you for coming and uh, thank you to the Department of Psychiatry for inviting me. Um, I will talk about my work it, uh, related to targeting function and neuroprotection in, with exercise specifically in people with neurodegenerative disease. Today I'll start by reviewing the background literature related to exercise in older adults who are aging without neurodegenerative disease. So what do we have, what kind of evidence do we have just in our older adult population on the effects of exercise. Second, I'll discuss my research related to identifying sensitive markers. Is the sound coming through okay? I, if I turn away a little bit? Okay. I just want to make sure that... Okay. Second, I'll discuss my research related to identifying sensitive functional markers in older adults who are at risk for disability using a model of amnestic mild cognitive impairment, and Alzheimer's disease. And third, I'll share with you a parallel line of research that I've been involved with using exercise interventions for people with dementia and their caregivers and uh, people with Parkinson's disease. The first thing I'd like to review is the, uh, just a short history on the research related to physical activity and exercise in relation to cognitive function and risk for neurodegenerative disease. We know from previous research that higher levels of physical activity are associated with less global cognitive decline in general, less incident mild cognitive impairment, less incident dementia, and a lower risk for Parkinson's disease. It seems that dose of exercise matters. There's an inverse relationship in women 65 and older who walked uh, with the number of, of blocks that they walked. With the lower odds of cognitive decline 68 years later in the group that walked the most number of blocks. And starting early is better, but it's never too late. 
older women who are, are physically active as teenagers, and this was a re retrospective study of over 9,000 women, had the highest level of function, of cognitive function, and the lowest rates of cognitive impairment at older age. However, older women who were physically active at any age, starting at 30, 50, or later in life, were less likely to have cognitive impairment later in life compared to women who remained inactive. In the literature, we've also seen, and this literature is now over a decade old, protective effects of physical fitness on brain regions that are prone to age-related atrophy. So there's been, it's been shown that there's a protective effect of gray matter and white matter regions that are prone to age-related decline uh, and have been shown, uh, this is uh, worsened in, p or, le or worse, more atrophy in people who have worse physical fitness, lower levels of physical fitness. And there's also been evidence that there's actually neuroplastic effects of exercise, and in this case aerobic exercise, on areas of the brain that are also um, prone to aging and related to uh, executive function and memory. So uh, actual improvement in the volume of particular structures in relation to aerobic exercise and fitness. And a compelling study done in, uh, published in 2010 by Erickson actually shows that there could be improvement in the structure, brain structures related to memory in people who are exercising at a moderate level. And when I say a moderate level, they're walking. They're walking at a level of 60 to 75 percent of their estimated maximum heart rate for age. And in this particular study, what was shown is that people who walked at a moderate level, did a moderate aerobic exercise, compared to the group who did a stretching control, improved in the size and the volume of their anterior hippocampus, more on the left than the right. And this was particularly compelling because in general, with age, the hippocampus declines about 2% per year after the age of 65. And in this case, we see we have an average age of 68. The hippocampus is actually increasing in volume over this one-year period in people who did the aerobic exercise. And compared to the control group, where we see a 1.4% decline in volume over the same period of time. In addition to exercise and fitness, we've also seen a relationship between physical performance, such as gait speed, uh, in relation to cognitive function. If we just look at fast walking speed, we've seen that it's associated with cognitive function in older adults. Higher performance on cognitive tests <coughs> has been seen in people with faster gait speed on executive function, memory, and global cognition. There's also been a lower incidence of dementia associated with people who have a faster gait speed in older age. And gait actually slows at different levels of cognition as early as uh, early risk factor of having mild cognitive impairment. In healthy older adults, we see that normal walking without any type of cognitive load, think that, oh, I can see that there. Normal walking without cognitive load, without a, a cognitive task at the same time, slows uh, as cognitive impairment increases. So as we see, we see healthy, uh, healthy older adults, people with mild cognitive impairment, mild AD, and it's progressively worsening as the disease, Alzheimer's disease progresses. The red line shows people doing some type of cognitive task as they're walking, counting backwards by threes, counting backwards by sevens, doing some type of task that would give them a cognitive load. So we see that in general, in all people, 
the, the rate or the pace is slower. But uh, we also see this decline at the same rate with increasing disease. So from the previous literature, that's a quick overview, I'm going to make some assumptions. Most of that work, most of the work on fitness and exercise has been done in relatively healthy older adults. Relatively healthy older adults are able to complete the exercises without a lot of extra support, maybe a friend, maybe social support, um, uh, a good environment for it. But when we get into uh, populations with neurodegenerative disease, there are many more barriers. So there's fewer studies. There's less evidence on people with neurodegenerative disease as far as the effects of exercise. So we have to make, take some assumptions from the previous literature as well as the animal literature, previous literature in, in healthy older adults. Well, one, it's, it appears there's plenty of evidence that says exercise contributes to brain health and brain resilience. Multiple mechanisms are likely to uh, be at play here. What we see is improved learning and memory, possible uh, uh, indicators, biomarkers of growth factors and various other biomarkers. And what I won't go into right now is multiple underlying neuroprotective mechanisms, physi physiological mechanisms that have been shown across studies. We've also seen that dose matters. The amount of exercise matters. And if we think about exercise as medicine, we also have to think about getting an, a sufficient dose of the exercise to be effective. We need regular exercise and extended periods of time. The previous literature has shown that for cognitive improvement in previous uh, uh, comparative effectiveness studies, six to 12 months is necessary before those, those effects are really seen. So we know if we're gonna see changes in older adults, healthy older adults, we do need that extended period of time. We also think that physical fitness and physical performance are potential mediators. The, the better our physical fitness gets, the better our function gets, which may be a result of the exercise process, the better potential people have to continue that exercise. So, Physical fitness and performance improves with exercise in people with neurodegenerative disease. We, we've seen that. It may facilitate participation in exercise and therefore continue a more regular and uh, potentially greater dose of exercise. Okay. Do you want the volume up on the computer or on the microphone? Do people need a uh, greater volume? Yeah. Yes. <coughs> How's that? Is that better? How's it in, is it, can you hear in the back? Oh, that's much better. Okay. Thank you. We should be able to move this a little bit. It should pick up enough. Can you hear me? Is that loud enough? Okay. It's better for me. Okay. So from here, I propose a model for improving and or maintaining brain health in older adults with neurodegenerative disease. And what we see here is if we look at exercise as uh, a source of exercise as the, uh, what we're trying to deliver, and we see physical performance as a very important mediator, and these are highly correlated um, uh, measures, Exercise has been shown to reduce di disease processes. It's been shown to improve uh, brain metabolism and structures, and therefore leading to better brain health. That better brain health, of course, will help us help people facilitate <coughs> ongoing uh, types of participation. We can't forget those personal factors and those environmental factors that m will uh, affect people's ability to participate. I'm going to switch gears a little bit into the first area that I've been working on is identifying functional and neuroimaging markers, potentially markers that will identify people early who are at risk for decline 
as well as sensitive markers or sensitive measures that we can look at the outcomes, the effects of our, our exercise interventions. And in this case, I'll use our, the model that we've been working on, on mild cognitive <coughs> impairment and Alzheimer's disease. If we look at L, uh, mild cognitive impairment, considered a transitional state between normal aging and dementia, and which is less severe than dementia, but beyond the age-related cognitive decline. This group of individuals is about 10 times, uh, uh, much 10 times higher risk for dementia. And two general categories of uh, mild cognitive impairment would be amnestic, more memory-related, and more a uh, higher risk for Alzheimer's, and non-amnestic, which would uh, possibly be involved with more vascular types of, of uh, pathology. We'll focus today on amnestic MCI and the risk for Alzheimer's. And if we look at the hippocampus alone, we see that the hippocampal structure is, you know, fairly easy to outline and uh, is significantly, has significantly greater atrophy for the same aged individual than um, uh, someone, a uh, cognitively intact individual. In general, clinically, we see progressive decline in cognitive function eventually leading to the loss of participation in daily activities and loss of, in, uh, loss of independence. Along with this, what we've seen in, in, in my research and, uh, and other people studying physical function in association with cognitive function, that loss of uh, uh, in ability to complete <coughs> instrumental a ADLs is kind of at that transition point of the diagnosis of dementia or conversion to dementia. And along with that, paralleling that, we've seen declines in physical performance, declines in gait speed, increase in gait variability or stride to stride variability as people increase in their disease severity, their walking just becomes more irregular an increase in the incidence of falls, and a reduction in balance have all been shown in people before the onset of dementia with uh, mild cognitive impairment. And this occurrence is higher than those with normal cognition for age. If we look at uh, Cliff Jack's model that shows a detection of biological biomarkers across the spectrum of cognitive decline and conversion to dementia, we may also consider early physical changes that occur at about the time or just bef uh, about the time of mild cognitive impairment. So it's been a, there's been a clear associations with the slowing of the physical performance as mild cognitive impairment comes on. It's possible that we may be able to look at this more closely and map physical performance such as gait speed which is an easily clinically observable uh, change that individuals have uh, onto some of the diagnostic categories of uh, progressive cognitive decline uh, and so in association with other physiological markers. If we just look at the hippocampus, you know, at first we say, well, why the hippocampus? Why would we look at the hippocampus in relation to physical function? when it's primarily a structure that's involved with more memory formation? Well, one, it's vulnerable to age-related changes. Two, those structures and surrounding structures are seed point for Alzheimer's disease pathology. And as I said earlier, we're seeing physical changes occurring at the uh, MCI and mild cognitive impairment or mild Alzheimer's disease. In addition, it's highly interconnected with cortical and subcortical brain regions that are involved in gait control. And it has connections with frontal regions, such as information processing with complex tasks and gait impairment when uh, working memory is challenged. <coughs> Looking at relationships between brain health and age, in relation to exercise, we've been able to see that it seems that people with higher levels of exercise actually 
do not necessarily decline in their medial temporal lobe uh, structural volume to the extent that people with lower level, levels of exercise do. So in this cross-sectional relationship, we see that people with low <coughs> levels of exercise have a moderate decline with age in their hippocamp or in their medial temporal lobe volume. Whereas people across the ages with high levels of exercise are not declining in their volume of the medial temporal lobe structures. So there seems to be a protective effect potentially, it is cross-sectional, on uh, the medial temporal lobe structures. And if we look at fitness, and fitness like from a treadmill test for um, uh, oxygen consumption in relation to brain volume. Studies have shown that people with higher levels of fitness have higher levels of brain volume, specifically in the hippocampus. Again, potentially a protective effect for people, uh, older adults, as well as people at risk for Alzheimer's. The next thing I'm going to do is present the research I've been doing in collaboration. I'm from the Department of Rehab Medicine, and we've been work I've been working with Dr. Valerie Kelly on um, measures in the Human Motion Analysis Lab, where we do gait analysis with a whole full marker set on individuals to look at various aspects of walking and movement patterns. In addition, I've been working with Dr. Linda Terry and her group, Re Rebecca Logston and Sue McCurry, clin uh, 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 clinical psychologists and researchers um, from the Northwest Research Group in a on Aging. And uh, the IBEX Center to do our imaging for structural MRI and some uh, metabolism. This has been funded by the Alzheimer's Association International as well as several uh, NIH grants uh, for various uh, older adult studies and exercise. The first study I'd like to describe is a comparison between people with mild cognitive impairment and uh, normal cognition. And these individuals were specifically screened for uh, amnestic MCI uh, with previous testing of cognitive function and a consensus board of clinical psychologists to determine a classification of normal cognition for age versus amnestic uh, mild cognitive impairment. If we look at this, we see a slight difference in age, uh, just you know, uh, a little less, just a little over two years difference in the groups between normal cognition for age and amnestic mild cognitive impairment. <coughs> However, as expected, we see that there's a significant difference on their cognitive function, with the amnestic <coughs> MCI group significantly lower in their, on their MMSE, their ADAS COG, the disease severity scale for Alzheimer's disease is not significantly different because these people didn't have Alzheimer's, so that's good, but differences on, in their logical memory tests uh, and uh, executive function tests, trail making, um, a and attention executive function, trail making A and trail making B tests. So if we look at these two groups and we compare the MCI to the cog cognitively normal group between the ages of 75 and 95, so we have an older group than uh, many of our previous aging uh, studies with exercise that we've seen. We then looked at, well, <coughs> what's different as far as their gait? What's different as far as their physical performance? And what falls out consistently, and this was after quite a bit of reduction of data, gait speed was significantly slower in our group with uh, Alzheimer, or I'm sorry, mild cognitive impairment, as well as stride length. Stride length was significantly slower. The other thing that was different is my uh, circles shifted here. So these circles uh, actually should be on stride length and stride length variability. The other thing that was different is the um, stride length variability. People with mild cognitive impairment were much more irregular step-to-step -step with their walking. 
we took these two variables. These two variables have been used previously and have been shown to be associated with medial temporal structures uh, in older adults. But very little has been done in comparing mild cognitive impairment to people with normal cognition for age. So when we just look at the relationships with age, if we look at the green line, those are people with normal cognition. As I said, there's 23. And uh, the people with the blue, the blue line represents the individuals with amnestic MCI. And we see it's not significant, but there is a greater relationship uh, between age and hippocampal volume. So as age increases, hippocampal volume is declining, and this is uh, uh, a fairly um, moderate, low to moderate uh, association. If we look at stride length in relation to age alone, we see similarly that people with normal cognition have less uh, decline, a less uh, a weaker association than the people with mild cognitive impairment in this case. So with age, as expected, <coughs> stride length decreases, but at a much greater extent in the people with cognitive impairment in this case. Now, if we look at stride length in relation to brain volume, in this case, we see that in the people with normal cognition, the green line, there's a moderate association, a correlation between stride length and hippocampal volume. Now, the difference we see here is there's a very weak correlation with stride length and hippocampal volume in the people with amnestic MCI. So it may be that it's this difference in the correlation that's going to tell that tells us something about this change of relationship between structures that may be telling us something about function overall. Looking at other limbic system structures, we see a similar relationship across these structures. In the, the green line, again, people with normal cognition maintain a moderate to strong relationship between stride length and hippocampal volume, volume of the amygdala, volume of the anterior cingulate and the posterior cingulate, all structures that have been involved with uh, early in stages of Alzheimer's disease. Interestingly, that relationship weakens in the people with mild cognitive impairment. So the relationship is weaker, and this was a surprise. We've seen relationships across older adults without a diagnosis of dementia or MCI, but here we're seeing that there's a significant difference in this relationship. There's a reduced range, of course, in both structures, both the gait speed and the structure. Something, looking at some of these associations, may tell us something about changes in function. Now when we think about, this just kind of gives more of the picture of stride length variability, that irregular walking has been associated with, uh, increased irregular walking has been associated with as the uh, uh, disease severity or cognitive impairment increases. So we'll look at stride length variability in relation to hippocampal volume, or, or limbic system structure volume. And in this case, we see that in the people with normal cognition, as brain volume increases, variability decreases. In the people with normal cognition, we have a relationship between brain volume, positive relationship, and decreased uh, variability. However, in the people with mild cognitive impairment, this relationship is flattened or weakened or reversed. So much more needs to be done on this, but this alone may show us that there's a significant change in the relationship between physical performance and cognitive function in older, between the older adults with uh, normal cognition versus MCI. So I'm going to change gears a little bit. What I just did is I talked about some measures. And we've got some parallel lines of research. We've got developing measures 
But then also trying to figure out, okay, on the ground, how are we going to implement exercise programs that give us the dose of exercise that we need to actually see change? And of course, there's multiple considerations. And coming back to, as we all know, there are many personal factors that may impact your dose of exercise, just general health, motivation, behavioral, mood, as well as environmental factors, social support, caregiver, uh, health, uh, or need for help, access to the exercise, and what kind of social network people have. That all influences people's access to exercise and ultimately will influence the dose of exercise and the ability to have ongoing exercise. We know from our, our literature, our growing body of literature, that exercise is protective. And even when people have disease processes, it's helping to possibly slow the, the disease progression in, across uh, different systems. And we also have seen in healthy older adults and possibly disease, people with disease processes, and this is the early stage of research, that it's potentially uh, improving brain health or slowing the decline. So this is an actual real picture of the East Coast from this. <laughs> and we can understand that we all have barriers and multi multiple types of barriers. Uh, and this is just one of the physical barriers that people on the East Coast had uh, this winter. So exercise sounds easy, but for people with neurodegenerative disease, there are multiple barriers. And if we think about this kind of structurally, if, we're, if we break this down into some manageable categories, well, people who are aging normally, relatively normal cognition, they don't necessarily need a lot of support. Of course, some social support, some you know, motivation, having a friend exercise, having a group to go to is definitely going to help that dose of exercise and that ongoing participation. But when we start into the people with early degenerative disease, and that may be even the risk, a risk category of mild cognitive impairment, who don't officially have Alzheimer's, but they're at risk and we know that they have some cognitive decline that may be reducing or impacting their participation. Well, we need, they need a little more structure. They potentially would benefit from structure and potentially motivation, and they still need social support. Okay, we all need social support. And then as the disease, as disease stages progress in neurodegenerative disease, those later stages, they, we need to do everything, okay? Maybe they need physical assistance to, to actually get a dose of exercise, supervision, is facilitated, structure, and they still need social support, okay? So thinking about this as just kind of three big stages, a quote from Hirsch and Farley related to Parkinson's disease, in patients without specific contraindications, we should be encouraging exercise training programs that focus on achieving a higher training intensity beyond what our patients would self-select. And I think this is the key for our populations. Beyond what the patient would self-select, because if we left it up to them, they may not be able to perform it for a variety of reasons. I won't go into this, but we have great recommendations from the American College of Sports Medicine, American Heart Association. We have recommendations for prevention of chronic disease for all adults. And these are pretty standard, you know, moderate level of exercise, uh, greater than 150 minutes per week of physical activity. That could be a variety of physical activity, uh, types of physical activity. Greater than 30 minutes of moderate physical activity at least five days a week. Or vigorous activity for 20 minutes, three days a week. Now these are minimal. The latest recommendations that are coming out are saying, this is, this might, you know, this is going to help but even greater. These are the minimal recommendations. So at this point, I'm going to talk about what we've done. As I said, this is kind of a parallel line of research with developing measures. Two examples of University of Washington studies, uh, exercise programs designed for people with neurodegenerative disease, considering all of the factors we've talked about. 
First one is Dr. Linda Terry's study. It's an R01 funded by um, uh, NIA. And I've been working closely with Dr. Uh, Terry, Rebecca Logston, and Sue McCurry, have all been great mentors to me over the last several years. This is an in-home exercise program and behavior management. It's a train-the-trainer model, and they work with the area agencies on aging in Oregon and Washington. They're training the trainers who are at the area agencies, um, area agencies on aging to perform the exercise to go into the homes and coach not only the person with Alzheimer's or, or dementia, a variety of uh, dementia diagnoses, but also the, in, the caregiver. And it's not only the person with dementia who's exercising, it's the caregiver who's expected to exercise along with the person with dementia. So that kind of, you know, really is one of those facilitators because both are invested. They're looking at uh, this dyad model in 208 community uh, dwelling in, uh, couples. And this could be, um, you know, it may be a spouse, it could be a, a son or daughter, a variety of people. Uh, or in general, I've seen mostly that it's been uh, spouses. They have to have a diagnosis of dementia greater than 60, living in the community, not in residential care, so an effort to help people stay in the home. and. Before they started, less than or equal to 150 minutes of moderate exercise per week. So as I said, it's an in-home intervention, nine one-hour sessions with the coach over a six-week period, and then the caregiver and recipient agree to exercise together for at least 30 minutes per day for six weeks. The outcomes are measured by phone interviews, and that was the original uh, grant. And then we wrote a supplement, and that's where I came in with doing some physical assessments in the home. So we're doing three assessment periods of functional mobility at baseline. Then there's a, there's a four week waiting period right before they start the exercise and immediately after the exercise. And what we're using for this in-home uh, uh, evaluation are some basic standard stopwatch tests Okay, so and balance tests that we always do as physical therapists. But we've also added what we call a portable motion analysis lab. This was a system developed in Portland for people with Parkinson's disease. And we've been able to successfully apply it to people with dementia. It has six small sensors, and this is what this picture here is showing. They're wireless. They're about the weight of a wristwatch. And we put them on the sternum, the waist, the wrists, and the ankles. And what it does is it picks up the motion patterns, not only for walking in the home, but also getting out of a chair and, and doing balance tests. So we've been able to do many of our standard physical performance tests with an additional, more sensitive measure of using the um, uh, APDM system. So it's worked quite nicely, it's very user friendly, and our research assistants have been able to apply the, the study. This is mid-study. We've uh, now collected data uh, baseline for about 30 people with, uh, with the APDM system. So we'll have, uh, eventually we'll have 78 dyads. We're not only testing, again, the person with dementia, but also their caregiver. In addition, a parallel study uh, with that has been uh, some variable funding for a pilot study to further look at this use of the wireless motion analysis system in people's homes. So we do laboratory testing in the lab uh, in rehab medicine where we have all the cameras and so on and in conjunction with our wireless system so that we can further validate uh, its, its ability to use this outside of the lab. This potentially has the ability in the future to be used out, outside. So. We're using it in, within their home environment, where, where they're functioning every day, where they may, but may be at risk for falling, and so on. So that gives you a view of what I've been working with with individuals with dementia, or at risk for dementia. And now I'm gonna switch gears, but with the same kind of idea of trying to reduce the barriers and increase the exercise dose for people with neurodegenerative disease. I'm going to switch gears and talk about a program that we developed for people with Parkinson's. 
And coming to this as a physical therapist and after working with Dr. Terry uh, uh, with uh, individuals with cognitive impairment, we developed a tandem biking program. And this wasn't our, uh, my idea, it really came out of the Cleveland Clinic where uh, Jay Alberts was the, the researcher on this, got the idea that tandem biking, having the person with Parkinson's sit on the back of the bike and a healthy individual or a healthy uh, cyclist pedal from the front of the bike could facilitate cycling at a faster rate than the person would self-initiate. The faster rate as well as a more consistent rate and possibly then be able to not only get that motor input but get a consistent increase in aerobic exercise. They had a very small study they tested five people in tandem and five people solo cycling with Parkinson's and they had some pretty exciting results where they actually saw a reduction in some of the symptoms of Parkinson's mm -hmm. after uh, approximately eight weeks, three times a, a week. Well, I, I did stumble across this. I, there was a program and this was initiated, really kind of uh, started within the Parkinson's community. They said, hey, why don't we start uh, our own group program. And Northwest Hospital had kind of a back room and they had some great clinicians who said this is really exciting. And they set up this wonderful infrastructure. And the infrastructure, they were really thought about everything. They thought about the structure that you need. We needed structure for individuals. We needed um, to, uh, to um, you know, adjust for people who had some cognitive impairment. We had to have people there to physically assist and so on. So we set this up as a community program. We had volunteers on the front of the bike, and those were called the captains, and that's tandem biking terminology. The volunteers came from all over. They came from Northwest Parkinson's Association. They, they were friends and family of uh, people with Parkinson's. They were our physical therapy students. And this particular picture, I, on Fridays, they, the students actually had the day off, so they came and volunteered for the program. And then we had uh, our, uh, an instructor so we set this up at Magnuson Park in uh, the community, the, the um, city of Seattle had a room and they, uh, I got really lucky, they gave us a free room at that time. So, and Outdoors for All, uh, a nonprofit organization that provides outdoor programming for people with disabilities, provided the tandem bikes because they weren't using them uh, in, uh, other than the uh, summer. We put them on stands and trainers and uh, having that person in front pedal facilitated the pace. So it was indoors, as I said, volunteers were, uh, the captains were volunteers, and we followed a high cadence program. And this was a protocol developed by Dr. Alberts in, again, with that concept of propelling at a faster rate than they would self-select. So it was 80 to 90 RPMs was uh, determined as about 20 to 30% higher than people would generally self-select for their pedaling rate. So that's what they did. 60 to, uh, or 80 to 90 RPMs for 40 minutes, three times a week. So why tandem cycling? It's, we could get aerobic exercise out of it. They were polar heart rate monitors and we could measure that they were at a moderate level of aerobic exercise. Again, 60 to 75% of their estimated maximum heart rate. And we kept them there. We didn't let them go into high intensity. There's a high cadence, faster than they would self-initiate. It was a more consistent pace. And that consistent pace was not only the motor facilitation, but we found there was also a, um, a, an attention. Uh, if we could help them attend to their task. So they had a cadence meter that they would watch as well. And their coaches and us would, or their, their fellow riders would help them stay on task. <clears throat> they got a higher dose than they might get themselves of exercise. There was social support and probably most important, it was safe. Once they got on the bike, it was safe and it was a lot of fun. Who were these individuals? Well, we had an average age of 64. 59% were males. Average uh, of six years of uh, being diagnosed with PD, although we had anywhere from six months to, to 20 years. We had some people who had brain, deep brain stimulators, and about half of them were on 
uh, uh, L-DOPA uh, medications. Their targets, they had targets that they had to meet. And like I said, it was very structured. They knew exactly what they were doing each day. And we also promoted self-efficacy. Um, uh, we tried to have them come in and do their own blood pressure. They tracked their heart rate. Um, they, they discussed their, their goals. So they started off at 50 to 60 RPMs, nice and easy, for 10 minutes. Then we brought them up to 80 to 90 RPMs, again facilitated by the, the captain. They rode for 40 minutes, cooled down. We emphasized how recovery is just as important as the exercise. And um, they uh, uh, were at an exertion, a self-reported exertion, about three, uh, uh, three to four on a Borg scale, modified Borg scale, out of, uh, out of 10, which seems low, but that was a really good rate. They were at their moderate level um, for that duration, and they were comfortable in maintaining it for that long. So you see, we had a coach, we had somebody monitoring their heart rate on a regular basis, and we also did some qualitative interviews on 17 individuals about what they felt were the benefits, uh, or not the benefits, of the, the program. It was interesting. Um, you know, almost 70% said they had better physical stamina, better strength and power, balance and stability. And it was uh, interesting to hear them talk about they felt like they had much better sleep quality. That was a huge one. Most people would come in and say, I feel a lot more energetic after, about th after the three weeks of getting them started. Then they started to have more energy to do their daily activities. They felt their mood was better and cognition was better. Now this was qualitative research, so these were statements like, I'm managing my money, money better at the grocery store. I feel sharper. I feel sharper at playing um, bridge. And so these are examples of some of the statements. I'm sleeping better. I notice my printing has improved. My bridge game has improved. I'm looking for other groups that uh, do something active. So lots of nice things towards greater participation. Uh, I feel stronger, you know, definitely uh, things that would indicate they're more likely, or they, they've, they've really kind of got the bug, that they want to exercise ongoing. The great thing is, well, the first thing in this study, this was, you know, our first go at it. We um, did a feasibility outcomes. We had a retention rate of 100% of 42 people. So everybody made it through the 10 weeks. Um, the attendance was 96%. Uh, they really just missed because they had some pre, uh, they had a doctor's appointment, they had something scheduled ahead of time. Those who met that heart rate goal, that 60 to 70 percent of, of uh, estimated maximum heart rate, those are 87 percent. Now there are some that maybe they're on uh, uh, some type of medication or there may be some autonomic um, uh, factors that are involved that there are, there are some things in the literature now saying that some people are not increasing their heart rate uh, at a typical rate um, as would be expected with exercise. 95% were able to meet the cadence goal within the first three weeks, so maintaining that 80 to 90 RPMs with the help of their partner. And we didn't have any adverse events, okay? Now we did exclude people with uh, heart disease and, and diabetes and so on, but we did not have any incidents of um, uh, adverse events. This is just a quick overview of the physical performance outcomes. We had a couple cognitive measures that we took. But if we look at, there was significant improvement from baseline in this group on the Berg Balance Scale, um, the short physical performance battery, uh, five times chair stand. These are all indicators of falls and mobility in older adult populations, uh, timed up and go, and, and gait speed. So, we see uh, a, pe a patient population with neurodegenerative disease that improved significantly with the exercise program in their physical performance. And further research, we had a slight increase on, the, um, uh, on one of our cognitive tests, but nothing else. Further studies, and more sensitive or a better design for the cognitive test probably has to be done for future studies. So we are right now in the process of writing grants. We're putting in a PCORI grant um, soon to try to expand this program uh, beyond just tandem biking, but look at multiple aerobic exercise programs 
with this idea of reducing barriers to making it accessible and trying to figure out how to structure and facilitate ongoing exercise. So in summary, this, this program targeting neuroprotective and neurodegenerative disease with exercise looks at identifying early markers of decline in disability, targets modifiable factors, tries to reduce barriers and facilitate uh, exercise, facilitating effective types of exercise as well as ongoing participation, adapt the exercise across the spectrum of disease, and eventually provide some longitudinal measures of function and disability. There's many, many people to thank for this. We have uh, many people involved in rehab medicine and internal as well as external funding uh, for the tandem biking program, as well as for the other research re related to cognitive impairment and Alzheimer's disease, uh, people in rehab medicine, the Northwest uh, Research Group on Aging, and the IBEC, the Integrated Bra Brain Imaging Center. So, so that's all I have for today, and I think we have a little time for questions. Uh, yes. I'm a very active psychiatrist, so I, this is great. I'm okay. really excited. Usually, the questions we have are about mm -hmm. research, uh -huh. but it's not here yet. And I also teach physical therapy. Oh, great. So I, yeah. I, I guess one of my questions is um, so a lot of times there is also a cognitively impaired child, so you're relying on someone else. Is there, are there other things you can tell patients? Mm -hmm. There's no plan for how to help them do that better. So is there a way I can mm -hmm. family them? Yeah. So just say, I think we have some outline people. I have to re repeat the question. Um, so the idea is you ha many times we have people with cognitive impairment who also have a, a cognitive, cognitively impaired uh, partner. And um, the exercise is just not working. I in those cases, I mean, because it's not being done. And I think that's, that's the critical thing that we're trying to do here, and we've seen that um, in, both, in both of these populations, as well as the um, Parkinson's population, that we need to develop some type of strategies. Uh, so in that case where you have a partner at home that can't do the exercise or can't help them, then uh, are there uh, exercise groups that both of them could go to together so that they have somebody who's facilitating it. It, it needs a lot of structure. It needs, um, the, the group needs its structure. Uh, or can they bring somebody else in to actually um, exercise with them? So I, I, with the cognitively impaired uh, population, and this is also working with my students with uh, you know, physical therapy and, and so on, we are not. We need to do a better job as physical therapists to figure out ways to facilitate the exercise in these situations, because giving our just handout of exercise is not working. So that's why I learned so much from working with um, Linda Terry's group, is because what they did is they incorporated that support and the and the structure. And it was the support and the structure in both of these programs that led to, uh, that, that are leading to good, um, uh, at least adherence. Um, so the feasibility goes up. I think we, we're still at a stage we really need to be looking at the, at the outcomes in relation to that. But it's the key component, is the structure and the, the support in there. The tandem bike seems like a, such a fantastic idea. Even if you couldn't get two people that were going at a faster pace, uh, even if you had two folks that were geriatric, that would make it much more likely people would do it. And yes. what, what I wonder about is doing some study where you got Medicare to pay for the for a certain group population and see what happens. Uh -huh. uh, I would suspect it wouldn't cost that much. You can get probably cheap versions of this. 
and it'll probably save a ton of money. Yeah, so again, to repeat it for other people, that uh, tandem biking, uh, even in people, uh, if you had a partner, just having that, uh, that partner, whether they're the same age or the same ability, probably would help the uh, 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 participation in it. And uh, I absolutely agree. I think we had 100% completion rate because we, they had to be there. Uh, you had a partner who had to be there. Your, your partner was waiting for you. And these volunteers, they were there because they, it was the best volunteer job around, you know. It, it was fun. So um, they were there, they were friends. And it's, and the people who continued the exercise, this we, we need to do further study. We ended up with um, people who drove, sometimes I had people driving over an hour to get there, three times a week. Well, they're done with the study and they go home and they go back to the Y and they don't have an uh, exercise partner. Just anecdotally, people who told me that they, jo they joined up with one of their friends from the class, they're still riding and I bump into them all the time. Uh, so somehow, the next studies, we're trying to figure out, okay, how can we, one, get this out in the community? So that's our precory. We're trying to you know, work on getting this out in, into surrounding Ys. Uh, not only just hand and biking, because it can be complex, but uh, that, that idea that there's programs offered with little barriers that are adapted to their abilities. Um, but, uh, so, there's a lot of factors there, and, and uh, yes, I think expanding this to other populations would be easy. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yes? Was it in a rural setting? Was any of the research done in a rural setting? This particular, uh, oh yes, well, Dr. Terry's study is uh, all over uh, Washington and Oregon. Uh, they've got, um, one of the AAAs is out on the Olympic Peninsula. They've got Eastern Washington. Go all the way to Southern Oregon. So, yes. Mm -hmm. Yes? Is there any um, research on uh, the benefits of resistance exercise training for this population? And are there any plans to add a resistance exercise component to the To the Parkinson's? Uh, so the question is, there any, uh, is there any evidence for resistance, uh, uh, benefits of resistance, as well as will we plan to add resistance? Um, there's definitely evidence in Parkinson's that multiple forms of exercise help. As uh, including resistance exercise, help in, in physical function. Um, as far as what we've got, we're going to start looking. We're looking at this idea of a forced pace of aerobic exercise versus a self-paced aerobic exercise, just to see is is there actual benefit in, in forcing the pace? You know, we do treadmill training where we force the pace a little faster than they can self-initiate. Um, the other studies have done that and. So we're going to look at that first and stay with aerobic exercise because it's a little more manageable. But as far as uh, the benefits of doing a multi-component exercise program, there's lots of support for that. I think it's, again, the groups work well, the uh, having an exercise partner works well in, the, in those venues as well. So. Okay, I guess there's no questions from the, uh, oh, was I supposed to? Okay, no questions from the outer regions. So, okay. all right, well, thank you very much.